It's good to have you in church. Have a seat. I'm going to have some church news. First thing on church news is tonight is Cafe Church, and uh, we're going to be downstairs. It's a potluck evening, so if you're coming along, uh, thank you, Otto. Uh, if you're coming along, I want you to bring something along to share. Uh, it doesn't have to be something incredible, unless it's just for me. <laughs> then make it incredible. Zucchini. No zucchini. Zucchini. <laughs> yeah. So we're not free, and on this occasion we're welcoming Alfred. Is that alright, Alfred? Anyway, so tonight, 6 o'clock, uh, we're going to be downstairs enjoying time around the table. Now, um, we were going to have Louise speaking tonight with Stan and also with Honor, but Louise has had a fall through the week and she has broken her tailbone. Uh, and so, been quite pregnant and with a broken tailbone, um, we're just going to pray for her this morning as well. We've got a little bit of sickness around today as well. Trish has a, a kidney infection, so I'd really uh, appreciate your praying for, for Trish, uh, that, that, will, that will disappear very quickly. She is on the mend, but the last couple of days have been pretty, pretty painful for her. Uh, and Naomi, who's normally on camera for us, she's uh, had a wisdom teeth all out on Friday. Yep. So there's a bunch of pain, and I know Bev down the front here is in pain too. And so I'm thinking that right now we're just going to spend some time praying healing into our church and just asking Jesus to come and be manifest in th that particular way uh, today. So if you want to pray with me, feel free to do so. Don't just be led by me. Engage your heart, your imagination with the kingdom as well and invite Jesus to come and, and touch uh, all the people that I've spoken of. And if I haven't spoken your name and you're not feeling well, uh, don't hesitate to pray that over yourself too. So let's just pray together. Yeah. And so Jesus, your word tells us to ask and keep on asking. And what I love about that is you invite us into conversations that sometimes we feel come to an end that we don't want. But you keep saying, come back and ask, come back and speak, come back and spend the time. And so this morning, Father, we're coming back into, to, I guess, that place of the throne room of heaven where you so freely welcome us. To lift up those of our own that are suffering or hurting right at this very moment. And Jesus, I pray for Bev this morning that today an encounter with Christ's healing spirit will come and we speak to the pain again as we did in our last cafe church service. Uh, we just love on Bev so much and we just thank you so much for her heart, so much for what she carries and so much, Father, for what she gives for the kingdom. And I just want to pray that today that something of your kingdom will flow so strongly back into her and, Lord, release her from the pain and discomfort. And so, Lord, that today inside of this room that she'll have healing. I pray the same for Trish to heal the, the infection in the kidneys. I pray the same for Louise that we speak to that tailbone and command it to come back together again in the mighty name of Christ. We think of Naomi as she um, convalesces and, and heals from uh, wisdom teeth surgery. And today, Father, we want to pray healing over her. And so, Lord, I'm such a believer that when we pray healing over one, healing flows to many. And so, Lord, I, I just pray for the, our church that healing will flow in and through it. I know that this time of winter it's cold and flus are on the rise, but Lord, I want to pray that there will be a real healing given to our church at this particular time and, and that it will flow over many. And so even people who don't come from our church, Lord, will find healing from those who do. And I pray that today, Lord, that there'll be so many manifestations of healing that flow out from us as a church. Lord, we thank you for the power of the relationship that you've given to us. And this morning, Lord, we want to sow more into that. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, yep, tonight is Cafe Church. Everybody's welcome at 6 o'clock. Um, this is our June Faith Offering Month as well, and uh, you most likely got an email from me this week. If you haven't got an email from me, it's because I don't have your email address. Uh, just, just encouraging you and educating, I guess, a bit on what we do with our faith offering. Uh, and so our faith offering is designated for two different purposes this year. Uh, one of it is for our buildings, which we do desperately need that. And we just want to um, continue to upkeep this, these buildings. They're wonderful buildings. Uh, but we just need, again, I guess, funds to continue to, to that work. But we're also committed to um, paying for Zach's college fees for Hillsong for the next 12 months. Uh, which is very generous, and um, and I just want to say that that money has already been underwritten, and, and uh, just shows some of the generosity that's inside of our church right now. 
Um, and so I want to say thank you to everyone who's given to that. Uh, but if, as the offerings bags come round, and maybe this is not enough notice, if you needed an off, a faith offering slip, um, you need to put it in a faith offering envelope uh, and drop it in the offering bag. Uh, otherwise, just grab one after the service and just hand it to me or Ida. Uh, that will be perfect as well. Um, we always talk about our faith offering as giving over and above what we normally give for church. Again, this whole concept of giving at times is quite difficult to talk about and challenging because it's just sometimes it's awkward. But I just want to say that as a church, we want to invest. And we invest everything. Why is it often so much that when we get to our, tithe, our, our finances that we go, we'll invest everything else but that? Um, I want to encourage you to just step out of that, that uh, God is no man's debtor. And just to step out in faith and to give to what the kingdom is doing here. And just to encourage you that the kingdom's reach in and through this church is now Sydney-wide. And I don't say that to pump our tyres up, but I say it to tell you that there are many, many churches that have been ministered to by this church throughout Sydney, throughout uh, the Southern Highlands, uh, throughout Wollongong. Uh, there are so many parts that connect in with us over a week. And so what we see here in church of 50 or 60 people is just a very small portion of what God is doing in and through us as a kingdom, kingdom church. So I just want to encourage you with your giving. Uh, also coming up, this is a, a date for August. Uh, on, the, on Saturday, the 11th of August, which is normally our extra service, um, I'm actually been asked to speak at Rye Baptist Church at a conference that they call Wellspring. And um, they've asked me to speak on the prophetic in teaching and empowering what it looks like to be in a church environment. And they've also asked me to teach on prophetic worship. Uh, and so... I'm, I'm one of two speakers on the day. Uh, there's more information coming on that. So if you're interested to come along or if you've been a part of a prophetic group with me, uh, you'll most likely enjoy and get more out of it. And again, as we come into the next couple of terms, if you're keen to get involved with the prophetic mentoring again, I want to encourage you to do so. Uh, there's more happening in those groups now than when they first started. Uh, God's revealed stuff, given stuff, shared stuff, and it's grown. And so if you want to go again, which I encourage you to do so, uh, please feel free to do. Are yep. you suggesting we pick up our service and go to Rye? <laughs> on August 11th. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, there is going to be an extra on August 18th. Okay. So, yep. So, I, I'm double dipping that in, in August. But yes, you can come along. It's quite a cheap one. It's only, I think it's $40 last year uh, for the whole day, and that includes lunch. And so, if you can do a conference that costs you only $40 and includes lunch anywhere, then good luck to you. Uh, and I, I trust and I hope. There will be some really great teaching. I can say that with all due humility. Um, also, this week, uh, we're starting a study on Romans in my Thursday night group. And last, night I put, uh, last week, I put out a call to anyone who wants to get involved with that. And a, a bunch more people have put their hands up and said, yep, we want to come along on Thursday night. It's going to be a fortnightly study on the book of Romans. Uh, Lisa and I are going to be leading that up. And uh, so come along, 7.30 this week. If you're coming, let me know. I'm thinking what we might do, instead of meeting in the chapel, which we normally do, we might actually meet downstairs in the Hope Centre, which has a bigger capacity uh, than just the couches that are sitting around. So if you're coming along on Thursday, you can park around the back and we can meet in the Hope Centre, okay? Uh, and it has heating and air conditioning. Hallelujah. Amen. So that, that's going to be great. Uh, we're going to take up our, our tithes and our offerings. How awesome are our kids? This week, Aston, your dad sent me a photo of you praying. So cool. So proud to see such a young man praying. But you were checking to see if his eyes were closed, weren't you? And were they closed? They were. He's a good dad, isn't he? Yeah, you got a great dad. Let's just pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for little Aston. He's a little man with a big faith. And I thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in and through him. I thank you for the love that's in his heart. And I thank you, Father, for the way that he blesses his family with the love that he carries. Jesus, I pray that this very day that you'll increase the love in this little man's life. Allow him to know your love today of the good, good father as much as his earthly dad. 
Father, I thank you for Jeremy, and I just thank you, Lord, for the enthusiasm that this little man has for life. I thank you for the, the wisdom that this young guy carries. And I look forward to the years ahead, Jesus, when the things that flow from his mouth that flow from the throne room of heaven. And we thank you, Lord, for Jeremy. Father, we thank you for Ellie. She brings joy wherever she goes. And we want to pray, Father, that this very day when she goes down to Kids Church, that joy will flow out of her and into all the kids that are there, the teachers that are there. We thank you, Father, for it. And for Susie, I just thank you for the leader that she already is. I thank you, Father, for the way that you're growing her tall and strong. But I thank you, Father, for her heart and her purity. And want to pray that today that faith will flow from this young woman of God. So, Lord, we come together and say thank you for all that we can give to financially through this church. And I thank you, Father, we have children to receive it. And so, Lord, today I pray that you'll continue to increase, I guess, the capacity for this church to give out of its fullness, not just in finances, but in all areas of life. And so, Lord, I want to pray that you'll take and use these offerings for your glory today. In Jesus' name. And so, Father, as we come to the word, that is our prayer, that new wine will flow out of us today because of what is about to occur when your word is declared. So, Lord, today our ears are open, our eyes are open, our hearts are ready. Allow your word to be spoken into our hearts today. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to have a seat. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to open up to Romans chapter 5. It's going to be up there on the screen as well. Romans 5 verse 6 says, When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps die, might be, perhaps be willing to die for a person who was especially good. How many especially good people have we here today? Absolutely, we've got more than one. Especially good, Pam. Good self-identity right happening there, good self-esteem. Uh, so it says, so most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who was especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. You hear that phrase? While we were still. Okay, were, past tense, were. While we were sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. How many friends of God do we have here today? Yeah. Uh, friendship is a beautiful thing, is it not? Friendship is a gift. Uh, friendship is one of those gifts that, she, that when you have one, you know that two gifts have been passed, not just one. Uh, you can't have a friendship with only one gift. You can attempt to, uh, but when there's a, a strong friendship, there's two gifts of love that have been passed across. And, and so friendship is all, always a, a two-person uh, party. It cannot be a single one, other than that's pretty lonely. Have a friendship with yourself. Might work for a time, but not forever. Uh, when I last uh, two weeks ago, I went to Cockatoo Island in the afternoon to have a look at uh, an art display on Cockatoo Island. Has anyone gone across to Cockatoo Island to see that art display? Jazz has, uh, Judy has. Um, it's quite an interesting art display. There are some phenomenal pieces of art, and there's other pieces of art you go, I probably could have done that myself. There's one piece of art which is literally uh, a room the size of the stage here and just has numbers thrown on the floor. It's art. You get to walk on it. You could even pick it up and throw it around if you want. And I walked out of that thinking, huh, I'm an artist. How about that? I can do this. It encouraged me greatly. Uh, there's another piece of art there which looks like that a crane has just picked up a whole chunk out of the harbour and stuck it up on the roof. And I thought, oh, I could do that too. And so it gave me inspiration to say that I, I could actually do these things. 
But one of the parts of Cockatoo Island which wasn't the art part is, is the old part and it's worthwhile having a look at. Uh, you might not know it, but apparently Cockatoo Island is our most haunted uh, part of Sydney. I didn't sense that, didn't see that, didn't, wasn't challenged by that while I was there. I was challenged by my ability to interpret art while I was there, but not by anything spiritual. Uh, but there's a part, uh, the old part, because it used to be a, um, a jail. And those, those buildings are still there. There's no roofs on them anymore. But they had these rooms of isolation where the worst of the worst in all of New South Wales would go to. Uh, up there you'll, you'll hear it said that it's the, it was the most inhumane uh, convict jail that we've ever had. Hard to imagine that, but there's little tiny rooms that people were there and forced to be alone, so they had to be separated, they had to be isolated. And what happens if you spend too much time in isolation, you'll go crazy. Conversations with yourself become quite normal. You might think that's okay now, but when it's by yourself, you, get, you quickly understand that we are designed for community and we are designed for friendship. That's a part of how God has designed us. And I know we're a few here this morning, but that's why church is such an important thing. God has designed us to be in community. And so this morning I want to talk about three things in these, these verses in the book of Romans chapter 5. And like I said, there's so much in the book of Romans that we're going to be speaking at and teaching at. And again on Thursday night, and I understand the Tuesday night Bible study is actually doing Ephesians. And so Ephesians is the, what they call Romans on light. It's Paul's abridged version of Romans. He packs it into Ephesians. There's so much in both of those books. And it's so cool to hear of both of our studies working alongside of each other like that. Uh, but Romans chapter Romans itself has a great theme of grace. And you're going to hear me talk and teach about grace for a number of weeks. And, and um, I trust that you won't get tired of it. I trust that there will be things of grace that you will learn and discover that of this new wine that we sing that will change the way that you live your life today. That will change the way you do relationships with, with people today. Uh, so much of this grace that, 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 that has been spoken about for 2,000 years I know has been hidden away at times because it's so easy to control people. And you can control people through fear, but it's harder to love people. And grace is always about love. If you are controlling someone, grace has been removed from the equation. Uh, so last year I used the phrase, you cannot love and manipulate somebody at the same time. Uh, and again, you come back to that to say that if you try to manipulate somebody to do whatever you want them to do, uh, then you are no longer loving on them. You are trying to control them. And so the book of Romans is spoken to a church that predominantly seems to be Gentile, which means not of Jewish faith or belief, but so much about Christ. And, and they're breaking free from this concept of the law to hold on to what it looks like in grace. And Paul keeps on speaking this word grace into their being. So much so by the time they get to the end of Romans, they might be saying, we get it. I trust that's going to be our journey as well. We get it. But friends are, are what we need. Uh, and every one of us, um, friends is what I think the Lord blesses us with. I, I have this strong belief that wherever you are in your life, that God has raised up people around you for such a time as this. That, that, that verse from Esther gets overused many times in churches for such a time as this. But I want to say to you right now, wherever you are right now in time, God has raised people up for you right now to help you, to support you, to encourage you, to sharpen you, uh, and, and to build you in Christ. That's, that's part of you being here today. I've discovered that very strongly with the prophetic groups that we're running, uh, and that particularly the ones that don't seem to be from our church. That, that These are random people that come from all over Sydney, but for such a time as this, it seems as though these groups have come together. And, and so God has raised up people uh, around them right now that are praying for them that, that previous to this they did not even know. Friendship. There, there's, if we go back into the Old Testament, there's a great story that I want to bring to you on the concept of friendship. And I want to talk about King David. Now, often when you talk about David and friendship, the first person that you go to is a man by the name of Jonathan. And, and Jonathan was a childhood friend, it seems, of, of, of David. And uh, he had David's back. But it's not Jonathan that I want to talk about. I want to go further forward in time than that to when David is king and he's been king for a long time. 
and a man by the name of Nathan turns up. Now, if you don't know the, the story of why Nathan turned up, Nathan was known as a prophet of God. And this is why having prophets amongst us is such an important thing. And this is why I teach, uh, teach of the prophetic, because all of us can hear from God and therefore all of us should be able to share something of God. Does that make sense? Are you with me all so far? The heaters have just come on, so don't, don't, don't check out just yet, right? Um, and, and so Nathan turns up when David's, um, he's been up onto the top of his palace. Uh, the army's gone out to battle and he's cast his eye around to look at his kingdom and what his eyes get fixed upon uh, is a naked woman. What was she doing up there? I don't know. Um, was she supposed to be there? I don't know. Uh, was David supposed to be looking at her? I don't know. Probably not. Let's just go with no, shall we? Can we do that? Can we just go with no? I was waiting for someone to argue with me just then. Say, no, he should not have been looking at a naked woman when it wasn't his wife or in David's situation, wives. <laughs> That's another can of worms right there. We're not going to open that today. Anyway, David, in his uh, supreme wisdom, decides that mm, I'm liking that. And so he takes Bathsheba to be his own and he gets her pregnant. And, um, and so David's solution to that is to try and push things under the carpet. Ever tried to do that with your, your sin or your issues in life where you just really hope that nobody discovers what you've just done? And so you, you go into overdrive to protect yourself, to make sure, no, no, there's nothing here, just keep on moving, keep on moving, nothing here, let's say a few jokes, nothing's here, keep on moving, keep on moving. Ever done that? We've all done it, right? We've all been there. Um, David did the same. But David's uh, version of, of sweeping things under the carpet might be a little bit more extreme than yours. So David decided that uh, to fix this solution so it can kept be kept under the carpet, we need to murder somebody. Uh, you can see how the string on David's jumper is starting to unwind right now. A and somebody's pulling it and it's, it's the lie that he's believing that he can get away with what he's just done. Anyway, so he kills Bathsheba's husband, but he doesn't really kill her. So his conscience, well, like what he really does is he puts Bathsheba's husband in the front of the army where the fighting is fiercest. So chances are he's going to die. But hey, if he lives, it's God's will. No. You can hear what David's doing, you can, and, and you could quite possibly put yourself in that situation where you'll try and do anything possible to protect yourself in that moment. You'll do anything possible to say to everyone, I'm actually okay. I didn't actually kill him. Somebody else with a sword did, or an arrow did, or a horse did, or somebody did, but I, I didn't do it. But I, I don't know if David's conscience works like my conscience. But I would not be high-fiving people over that decision to do that. I think I'd be carrying uh, two other kinds of gifts. Uh, the gifts of guilt and shame, which are no gifts at all to receive. But it's what seems to happen when we try and put things under the carpet. So David thought all of his Christmas has come at once. This guy's dead. I can marry this girl. This girl can have this child. And we can just go, yep, that's, that's my child. Uh, but again, in the midst of all this, of, of David trying to put this huge pile of dirt underneath this carpet that he's got in front of him metaphorically, uh, he, a friend by the name of Nathan comes and knocks on his door. And Nathan is a prophet of the God Most High. And, and so Nathan is welcome into these places and these scenarios. And it seems in the story in two seconds, Samuel, that David welcomes Nathaniel into his throne room. And, and Nathaniel says, uh, David, I've got a story for you. And, and David's like, well, tell me what that is. And he says, uh, well, it's this, there's a rich guy and there's a poor guy. Uh, and um, the rich guy wants the poor guy's lamb. The rich guy's got many lambs. And so he goes and kills the poor guy's lamb. And David's like, that's disgusting. Kill the person who did that. 
And, Dave, and Nathan goes, uh, David, that was, that was you. And, and all of a sudden, the carpet is pulled back. Why on earth would this be friendship? Love determines, or grace determines, that I will not leave you in your mess. Whenever you talk about grace to people, often people think of this phrase, they call it cheap grace, that, they, that I can just do whatever I want and God forgives me. Uh, I want to just wipe that phrase away because God does not say it's cheap or expensive grace, it's just grace. It's just grace. And if you choose to abuse what God has given to you, that is your call. But what grace is, is not about overlooking things. And so when people say, should I just overlook all the problems that have happened to me? No, you should never overlook things, but you should look beneath the surface at things. And what grace does, it doesn't just overlook. Grace looks at the problem beneath. And when we look at the problem beneath, we look to see what caused that poor behaviour above. And when we understand what the poor behaviour is above, then we can start addressing the deep need that is within and once we start address, addressing that deep need what happens is restoration healing and transformation are you with me because this is what grace looks like it does not look like that God's just overlooked everything it looks like God wants to restore and redeem everything all things are being made new is what the Bible says and so when God looks at you he doesn't just overlook you and go oh, okay you're a mess what he looks at is the deep things that are within you and says, those are the things that I want to draw out. Those are the things that I want to heal. Those are the parts of your life that I want to redeem. And your life is going to look so much different when these things are redeemed. And so God sends a man by the name of Nathan to a friend called David. And he says to David, you're the one that's hiding this stuff underneath. And I'm just going to pull it out right now. Now, David goes into free fall in the story. And this is what happens often when people are discovered in their sin or their discovered in their poor behavior they go into free fall of guilt and shame do you know what the first thing that Nathan then says to David he says to him do not fear because you are forgiven is that not a powerful outworking of grace I just want to say to you David you're forgiven which means God has removed all the obstacles he did not say that the circumstances have changed now or the, or the consequences of change, because when you do that kind of behavior, there are consequences that happen in and around you. But here is God saying through his friend Nathan to his friend David, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. This is how grace works, okay? So last week we did Grace 101. Uh, this is kind of Grace 102. In this passage of scripture, Paul says this, When we were utterly helpless, Christ came just at the right time and died for us sinners. This is the phrase in scripture that the church seems to have locked onto to say that you are a sinner. It's like I say to you most weeks at the moment, I'm going to keep saying it until we get a complete breakthrough in this to say that I'm no longer a sinner, I am now known by God. How God sees me, he doesn't see me by my sin, he sees me by my identity. And that's when he calls me out of mess to that place of what I was actually put on this planet to do. One is to love him, and the other is to love on others. But here in the scripture, it says here in the New Living, us sinners. Christ came at the right time and died for us sinners. Now every time I, I sort of read that sort of stuff in scripture, what I do is I go back to the Greek. Okay, so I'm going to give you a bit of Greek lessons today as well, if that's okay. Stay with me. The word in the Greek there is not sinner. The word in the Greek is ungodly. Christ came and died for the ungodly. You're with me? And you can understand why the word sinner could actually be put in there. Ungodly, sinner, you can understand why that could be interchanged. You can understand why they put it there. My issue is with the word us. Because in the Greek, it doesn't say us. It says Christ died for the ungodly. Now, here's the thing. When you come to Christ, you are no longer ungodly. You cannot be an ungodly Christian. That's called an oxymoron. Are you with me? Yep. Yes. 
You cannot be an ungodly Christian. It just doesn't happen. God came at the right, Christ came at the right time and died for the ungodly. Before you came to Christ, yes, you were ungodly. That's the truth. And when you came to Christ, and this is what we call conversion, this is what we call being born again, we are taken from being ungodly or sinner now to Christian in Christ. We'll talk a little bit more about that soon. But you can understand why the word sinner can be substituted for the word ungodly there. The problem that we've had in, in so many churches is that we tell people that they're sinners that need Jesus. But when they come to Jesus, we keep telling them they're sinners as if nothing happened at their conversion. Let me just say that again. When, when we come to church, we tell people that they're sinners and they need Jesus. The problem is when they come to Jesus, we still call them sinners. Nothing has changed if we still call people sinners. Are you with me? When we come to conversion, when we come to that place of accepting Christ, something supernatural is occurring in and through our lives that is transforming us. And what I've found with so many Christian churches that they will declare transformation, but they will not believe it. It'll be a theology rather than a reality because they want to keep you in that place of you're known by your sin. I cannot tell you how many people Ida and I meet with where that is the case. Half the reason that they come to us for deliverance ministry is because they have been convinced that they are known by their sin and they don't know how to deal with their guilt and shame. When Christ in his grace enters your life, the thing that he is attacking is your guilt and shame. That's what he is taking from you and you don't want that back, right? When Jesus says, I want all of your guilt and shame, when you take it back, I've heard Bill Johnson say, stop taking my stuff. That's what Jesus says. I've taken it. Stop taking it back. Stop taking it back. Guilt and shame is what is removed when we come to Christ. I want to say that if guilt and shame is a part of any relationship that you have, then the relationship will either die, it'll stall, or it'll slow down dramatically. It will not become abundant. Does that make sense to you? If you, have, if you think of any relationship you have right now with guilt and shame as a feature of it or a function of it, then you'll have a relationship that is either dying, dead, stalled, or barely moving. If you want relationships that are growing and thriving and that word abundant that we use in Scripture, if you want that word to be slapped across a relationship and believed to be tangible, then guilt and shame have got to be dealt with. The easiest way that I have discovered in dealing with guilt and shame in a relationship is by bringing it to the surface. Let it just be seen for what it is. So when I'm in a relationship with somebody uh, in prayer ministry and they say, should I share this stuff with my wife? Yes. Yes. Or a wife, should I share this stuff with my husband? Yes. Whatever you hide, you've got to keep hidden. Whatever you bring to light, truth can impact it. And this is where you see and discover where the relationships are going to go the distance. Because again, relationships should be built on trust. They should not be built on guilt and shame and control and manipulation. At the right time, Christ came into this world and died for the ungodly, which we were once, but now we are in Christ, which means we are no longer ungodly, which means now we are known by how Christ sees us. Now, as we go down through this passage, you see how Christ in his grace gives up his life for us. And we hear that, we know that story, and we just uh, we celebrate the story of what Christ has done for us. As we get to the end of this passage, there's two key things that I want to speak about this morning of how Paul describes his relationship with God. And the first one is in verse 11. 
It says this, so we can now rejoice in our wonderful new relationship. There's two words there that Paul uses, wonderful and new. I don't know how you describe your relationship with the Father in heaven, but Paul uses wonderful and new as two of his descriptive words. They're adjectives, just for all us English scholars in the room. Correctly used there, Lorraine? Is that, is that right? Oh, good. The concept of being wonderful, I want you to think about that. The word wonder is to be amazed. In just over two months, Trish and I are going to go to New Zealand. And you know we've been there a few times, but we cannot help but be amazed by what God has done in there. And so when we stand in front of a mountain, we are in wonder and we are full. So it means we are wonderful. The Apostle Paul, how does he get to this word? Well, in Galatians, he says something like this. Everything that I have done before my conversion, everything that I've done before Christ impacted me and met me on that Damascus road, I consider garbage. Every cent he'd earned, every deed he'd done, the career that he'd built, the people that he influenced, every single part of it, he goes, garbage, compared to what I've just discovered in Christ. You're with me? So again, it might all have been good stuff, but Paul says, compared to what I've found in Christ... It's just nothing. In Corinthians, the Apostle Paul would say, I've actually discovered this thing. It doesn't matter if I am in, in health or if I'm sick. It doesn't matter if I'm rich or if I'm poor, if I'm fed or if I'm hungry. I've found what it is to be content in God. And this is how Paul des defines his concept of, of wonderful. It's not just an adjective that he throws out there. It is actually a description of what he has actually seen and, and the reality of his, of his world as he lives this relationship with Christ. He calls it wonderful and he calls it new. He calls it new because he used to be, a, or he still is a Jew. I'm sure he hasn't changed his eth ethnicity. Is that the right way of saying it? Ethnicity? There we go. Uh, but at the same time... He's discovered something new that the old has not even been compared to, and he calls it wonderful. And I, I want to say to you, too, that there are words over your own Christian walk and relationship right now that are being grown and being defined. And maybe wonderful is the word that you use, and if it is, let's just praise God together. But there are other things about your Christian journey that might even be challenging. And at the same time, that's okay, because God's just leading you from one glory to the next. He's taking you from where you are and leading you to where you will be. And so when people come along and say, I want what you've got, Matt, and I say, you didn't want what I had 10 years ago. You wouldn't have wanted that 10 years ago, but you want it now because you've seen all the effort and the work that's drawn and the transformation that's happened. But so many people don't want to do the work. They just want to have the magic wand. And I want to say, that's not how grace works. Grace is a heart language. It's a language you need to learn. It's a language that you'll only learn as you love people. You can be taught it, but you've got to do it to learn it. One of the greatest gifts I have as a teacher is I do most of my learning as I teach. We've got a few teachers in the room. That's right, isn't it? It, it's, it happens a lot. Um, often, I remember years ago, people would say, I want to preach here. And I say, well, you've got to do scripture first. And they're like, no, I don't want to do scripture. I said, well, if you can teach kids, you can teach anybody. And if you're not willing to teach kids, you're not, you're not going to be allowed to teach anybody. And I was kind of hard and fast on it back then. Um, because, again, it's this concept of learning. And, and you've got to grow as a teacher as well. And, and as you start teaching, it's funny how things start making sense and start coming into place. But the whole concept with grace, you can only learn it as you love it. The last thing I want to focus on this morning is the word friends that we are a friend of God. Now, years ago, I remember a man had, had a, took offence at this word, that we are a friend of God, because it felt like it just wasn't giving God due respect. And that comes from a thinking and a mentality that God is so far above me when God says, I'm walking beside you. I think there is enough in Scripture to convince me that God walks beside me. There is enough in my own personal life that God walks beside me. And Jesus would say, not only beside you, Matt, but within you. And there is so much about our relationship with God that's in Scripture that I cannot deny that he is here and within me. But it's not just a theology, it's a reality. And that's the difference. And so when I hear that God is my friend, I don't have to theologize that. I just got to know that because that's what my encounter has been. The word friend in the Greek, though, and you'll be interested to know, is not the word friend. 
The word friend or friendship as it's recorded here in the New Living is to be reconciled. Does everyone here enjoy being reconciled to friends? Yep, you do, don't you? It's a great feeling when you are reconciled. It's that the relationship has been recreated or remade. That's when we say we've been reconciled. Now, here's an interesting thing. For it to be reconciled means that we already had a friendship. I want to bend your brain a little bit in this. Because at one point you're ungodly, came to Christ and he reconciled you back to him. The friendship was already there. All you did was reach out. That's what we call faith. And as Paul says, it's faith that brings you into place of relationship. But you were reconciled back to a friend that you didn't even know you had. That is how much he loves us. Before he even knew you, he loved you enough to reconcile himself to you. Before you even, even breathe the breath. Sounds like a song, doesn't it? Before you even breathe the breath, there is God reconciling himself to you. And he's been waiting for the day where you reach out in faith and just say, I'm just receiving that. And in that place of faith, all of a sudden, the whole transformed moment happens. The supernatural moment happens. You are taken from a place of being ungodly or sinner, never to be known that way again. And now, where once you were known as a sinner, now you are known as being a friend of God, where you have been reconciled to a God that already created the friendship long before you were born. This is how much he loves you. In John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. What, so that we could die? No, so that we could live. He didn't come here to condemn us. He came here to save us. And that is what our God is doing in this very room today. He is not calling us sinner. He is calling us now friend. And I want to say to you, you cannot be called both things. Jesus was known as a friend of sinners. I'd like to be known like that. Who would like to be known like that? I am a friend of sinners, which means I am willing to love those who have yet to find God. And I want to say to you, as soon as I choose to love those who are yet to know God, something supernatural is occurring. Why? Because love is God and God is love. And so when I'm loving, God's doing something. It's a supernatural act. You are a friend of God. Can you hear the language that I'm using? This is not a language of condemnation. This is not a language of guilt and shame. It's not a language of manipulation. It's not a language of I want you to do better. It's a language of relationship. It's a language of love. It's a language of grace that looks at a person and decides we're just going to talk at a deeper level. We're going to look beneath the surface. I'm not going to judge you because of what you've done. I'm going to love you because of who you are. It is a language. It is a language. Last week, I, I, I brought up the idea of having a, a, a relationship that cannot be offended. Again, it's a mind-bending kind of relationship, isn't it? But I wonder if we could be, as we transform, that offence means less to us. And as offence dies within us, let's just leave it dead. We don't need to resurrect that one. The less offence we hold, the more grace we can give. I want to pray with you. I think that's all I've got to say. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for a church that longs to hear the language of grace. And Father, I just want to commit us if I can, to this language of grace. Language of love. And last week we spoke out that grace is love being our first and only choice. Grace is when you love by faith and, and not by sight. 
What that means is you love people for who they are in Christ, not for what their behaviour is to turn them, determine them to be. Father, I want to pray for us today as a church that just place your hand upon each heart that's in the side of this room and just be calling us and drawing us into this abundant life that you're, you're actually speaking over us. But grace is the language. Grace is the mechanism. Grace is, is what you've given. And uh, even calling it a mechanism, that's not good enough. It's, it's a love. It's a language of love. And so, Lord, I want to pray that the language of love will just flow from me today and flow over people. And I pray that the language of love will flow from each one of us into the lives of others. And I pray that we might have the confidence that even when people tell us that we are a, that they're a sinner or they're stuck in their sin, that we can actually bring a greater truth into that. Like Nathan brought a greater truth into David's life. Uh, long before Christ was born, Nathan could say, uh, David, you are forgiven. And so, Father, I pray that you continue the work of transformation that you have begun. I thank you for the reconciliation that you've given long before we even entered into a relationship. You were already there. And so, Father, today, let this grace be like a new wine that flows over us today. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. In a word, that's what we call grace. The new wine of Christ. And so, Father, today, let your new wine, this grace, flow from each one into our relationships, into our work, into our families, into our church. So, Lord, I pray that even as we go downstairs, Lord, that it will just flow into every part of who we are as people, as believers in Christ. So, Lord, I just pray now your peace and grace be upon each person. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on downstairs and have a cup of coffee with us. In the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new.